Our next guest was opposed to the war in Iraq and the armed occupation that has followed, not only because so many innocents continue to be killed, but because he says it's creating greater insecurity throughout the world. A conscientious objector in Vietnam, he says many soldiers in Iraq have been propelled into situations that may haunt them for the rest of their lives and that conscientiously objecting to war is still an option. Let's take note with James Skelly, distinguished visiting professor of peace and conflict studies at Juniata College. As a lieutenant in the United States Navy, he filed for discharge as a conscientious objector rather than serve in Vietnam. When the Pentagon refused the application, he sued the Secretary of Defense in U.S. federal court. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, buddy. You say that the central question we face today is whether we should fear for our lives or fear for our humanity. What prompted such a question? Well, what, what's happening is that more and more often the wars that are being fought are fought against civilians. More and more civilians die in war. At the beginning of the 20th century, nine soldiers died for every civilian. Today the ratio is reversed. Um, what's happening is the potential is there anyhow for a much more brutalized world. We have to transcend war, it seems to me, get beyond it as a, a mechanism of policy. Uh, unfortunately, many people can't envision that, but I think citizens understand it. That's why there were such massive protests by citizens in the run-up to the war in Iraq. In September, <coughs> you co-wrote an open letter to soldiers who were involved in the occupation of Iraq. It was co-written by an Israeli paratroop officer. First, I want you to give us, I want you to tell me what the reaction has been to that letter, and then I want to talk a little bit about the letter itself. Well, we got a number of responses uh, from families of soldiers who were serving in Iraq. And the concern and the reason that we did write the letter is because I think we both have a sense of what happens to soldiers and the destruction of their own humanity in the process of engaging in the kind of conflict where it's, uh, uh, to, be, to be straightforward about it, a morally dubious project. Uh, certainly that's what my colleague Guy Grossman felt about the Israeli occupation in, in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. Um, and it seems to me that this is ex uh, clearer and clearer in Iraq, that it's a morally dubious project. I know the rhetoric of liberation, etc. But I think for ordinary soldiers on the ground, they're faced with trying to figure out who the enemy is and, and oftentimes they will wind up killing people or injuring people that probably should be secure in their homes but are not. You write in this letter, <clears throat> we write this letter because we have both been military officers during conflicts that descended into a moral abyss and from which we struggled to emerge with our humanity intact. Tell us about, uh, about your dilemma uh, as, a, as a lieutenant in the U.S. Navy and about what you think some of our soldiers in Iraq now face. Well, my dilemma was that I knew that if I served in warfare in Vietnam that I would be destroyed. My, my guess is, is that uh, I probably would have been uh, used the Irish solution and been drunk and dead by 40. Um, what I saw from many of my friends who came back from, from Vietnam was that they reminded me of the human version of a burnt-out church, that it had been scoured of its spiritual life. There was something empty and vacant in them. That's what we're going to see again with soldiers coming from back from Iraq. CNN did a, a documentary two weeks ago called Fit to Kill. And one of the soldiers that they interviewed who had served in the first Gulf War said that he was afraid of what he would become if he continued serving and killing people who were dis, uh, defined as enemies. That's what I fear for the soldiers, and that's what the mothers of some of the soldiers who wrote me said they feared as well, what their sons would become. You also write in this letter, people all over the world, and a significant number in the U.S. as well, will understand your actions as truly heroic should you say no to further participation? Yes, I mean, 
What we saw, I don't think it was as well covered here in the United States, although there were significant demonstrations, but certainly in Europe and other parts of the world, there were massive demonstrations by ordinary citizens against the war. They were against it because they realized, and Europe has great experience of this, they realized that it was ordinary citizens who would suffer. They realized that this is not a positive instrument of policy anymore, this kind of military activity. That's what has to change. We have to reformulate policy, force structures, and the way in which we work in the world when there is the potential for conflict. On the other hand, we <clears throat> did go into Iraq and according to uh, Senator John McCain, it is irresponsible to suggest that it is up to the Iraqis to win this war. In doing so, we shirk the responsibility that we willingly incurred when we assumed the burden of liberating and transforming their country for their sake and their own. Well, I think Senator McCain, and I heard his speech the other day, and I think Senator McCain understands very well that the Bush administration is preparing to leave Iraq. Uh, they keep quoting higher and higher numbers of security personnel who've been trained amongst the Iraqi population, now 131,000 today, uh, as I understand it. But I think they're really unwilling to do what is necessary to do, which is that they should go back to the international community, go back to the United Nations and say, we were wrong. Quite simply, we were wrong. We need your help. We need to help stabilize Iraq and create a democratic Iraq, but we cannot do it. We can support it, but we cannot do it. Unfortunately, I don't think they'll do that, and I, I think that what will happen is that more and more innocents, including American soldiers, will die as a consequence. Now, when, when you applied for CO status mm. during Vietnam, your application was denied, and you sued the Secretary of Defense. Mm. Tell us what happened and, and why your application was denied. My application was originally denied because it was not religiously based. However, in the interim, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, applications did not have to be religiously based. Um, the Navy then gave me a second hearing and um, afterwards uh, said that, well, I wasn't sincere after all. Um, uh, then I sued. Uh, the case made its way through the federal courts, um, uh, up through the U.S. Court of Appeals, and we were getting ready. They had ruled against me two to one, the Ninth Circuit, the famous Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and uh, they had ruled against me two to one, and we were getting ready for a reappeal uh, for a hearing en banc when I think the Navy had decided that I was a big enough thorn in their side that they would um, suddenly accept my resignation, which they, the Secretary of the Navy sent me a, a letter saying, um, I accept your resignation. Here's your honorable discharge. Please be out of the Navy in 48 hours. And in fine print at the bottom, it said, Certificate of Appreciation from President Nixon, not authorized. It's, uh, it's interesting because I don't think people realize how many uh, conscientious objectors there have been throughout our history. Uh, it was estimated that there were 200,000 mm. CEOs in the Vietnam War, uh, 4,300 in the Korean War, 37,000 in World War II, and 3,500 in World, World War I. The military actually uh, granted 111 CEOs from the first Gulf War before putting a stop to that practice and in fact imprisoning 2,500 soldiers who, uh, who wanted to apply yes, they, for they've that become, status. They've become much tougher about it, I think because they fear that the numbers could uh, balloon overnight, especially in the circumstances that the soldiers are facing in Iraq today. I think one of the little known facts though is that uh, soldiers often engage in resistance. I mean, there was enormous resistance um, amongst the rank and file during Vietnam. And even among ordinary citizens today, I think most people don't know how, what an enormous number of young people in America don't register for the draft. Last year it was 189,000. That's violating federal law. Their names and addresses have apparently been turned over to the Justice Department. but. Um, we don't hear very much about this. Nearly 200,000 people who have not signed up as they're meant to. There is no draft, though, so who, well, so who has mean, to sign up? All 18-year-olds have to sign up, uh, and they're required by law to do this, but they're not doing it. And, I mean, 
Some 77% do, but it's still a significant number who don't. Now, now, getting back to this letter, you also, in this letter, you warn soldiers to watch your back. You say, you can be assured that you or some of your comrades will be brought up on charges for what will be defined as crimes. And you, you talk in that letter about uh, the accidental killing uh, in Fallujah of, of Iraqi policemen mm. as an example of something that in the future could result in, in real charges for soldiers. Well, right now the situation is, has not become so politically problematic for the government, the American government, that, that this has happened, but I suspect it will. Human Rights Watch has said that there are now some 90 cases of civilians in Iraq who have been killed under circumstances that should be investigated. Now, what will not happen is that the people who place the soldiers in these difficult circumstances where it's they're having to sort out who the enemy is. They will never be charged. We know this. But some soldier will be charged, undoubtedly, because the government will have to show that it's doing the morally correct thing. They will not, however, challenge the larger moral context within which this war was initially fought and in which the occupation is being carried out. Now, David uh, Horowitz, who was a former anti-war activist who helped organize a, a campus demonstration against Vietnam back in 1962 at the University of uh, uh, California at Berkeley, he now says that his efforts unwittingly prolonged the war. I'm wondering what your reaction is to his comment. Well, I don't think it prolonged the war. I think Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon prolonged the war. I don't think there's any question about that. They were concerned with issues of credibility unfortunately, and so thousands more Americans and many, many Vietnamese died as a consequence of this concern with the credibility of the United States. We have just about a minute remaining, but what, what do you think needs to happen in Iraq? Uh, and, and how optimistic, I mean, we have 3,000 years of history and only 300 years of worldwide peace. I'm just wondering well, where we go from here. I think the United States needs a change. Uh, I think it needs to change its policies. I think that we need an orientation towards multilateral negotiation and support for democracy that is not at the point of gun. And on that note, we're out of time. Thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. We've been talking with Dr. James Skelly from Juniata College. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.